Thank you very much, Brian. Um, the uh, topic of the conference, or our goal, is actually to show also a comparison between the different countries. And what I found very intriguing is uh, the use, first, of graphic. Most of the films have graphic to uh, show in which country they are, which region they handle, and uh, the second part is, uh, point is actually uh, the show of technique as a technical uh, uh, modernism mm -hmm. shown mostly in cars and trains yeah. which are all over the world in, in these uh, yeah. uh, documentary films of that time. This is true. Uh, Aero Engine, of course, goes on forever about uh, bits of machinery. It's an early Anstey film. Um, the, the graphics is really interesting. I was trained in the early 60s on British television by a journalist, newspaper man, um, who would say that graphics were the voice of God. Um, that you, you believed it, right, finally. If they put a map up, it has to be true. Um, the maps are always absolutely asinine. I mean, like, you, 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 do you need to know where the coal fields are? They're sort of everywhere. They were. I have to tell you that there's only one deep pit working now in South Wales. So uh, there are 150 men underground instead of 750,000. So Mrs. Thatcher. As one of my friends said, uh, in the 80s when I was living in America, I rang and uh, I said, how are things? He said, Mrs. Thatcher's closed Wales. Um, <laughs> So that's all over. But, but, the, but the maps are really um, a, a very, a very typical. My favorite one is at the beginning of a film called Children at School, which I mean, the, the, the education system remains a prime engine of class divisiveness in Britain, right? And uh, this, uh, this graphic is wonderful because it's got emblemata. It's got a little rocking horse and various, for various stages of school, yeah? And it says, this is how the system works. And in silence, for 35 seconds, it scrolls up. And it says kindergarten, primary five to eight, junior eight to 11, <laughs> secondary model. <modern. laughs> it's just absolutely crazy. It doesn't explain anything, but it's the voice of God. Um, and, I, and, and, and I think that, that, that's true. And your point about, modern, your point about the use of, uh, of technology as a marker of modernity is, of course, absolutely crucial. Yes. Got, but let me be for. It's, it's okay. Yeah, you're you're doing well. Yeah. Let me be for a minute, uh, Grayson's advocate. Okay. Uh, if if we consider what uh, Thomas Elsasser told us that you have to consider the conditions, um, the films were made in, uh, and the restraints they were under, mm. uh, then you might perhaps take another perspective. Mm. Um, you, I think. You make a mistake if you look at the missing message. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, um, if you are deficit counting, uh, if you look at the source, uh, the intentional and unintentional value of the source, all these films wouldn't be there with this wonderful material which we now can interpret very differently than they have done so. So I think what Grierson uh, and his boys uh, uh, has left us, have left us, left us is, is a great wealth of material which has to be uh, read in a, in a new way. And I think then we, uh, we are ourselves very, very, um, how, how can I put that? I mean, we have a lot of this. We can take out a lot of knowledge and, uh, for our own intentions uh, after we have done so. Well, I, 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 <laughs> they always say that, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to say that I have a real problem about the argument. Um, the, 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 first, the first stage of the problem is that is really to do not with the films themselves, and I agree with you about them being a, a, a powerful source of uh, histoire for uh, l'histoire de mentalité, obviously. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, that Grierson was living a lie right, and that the films are presented as being um, an archive of radical texts, but if you go through the official um, uh, uh, archive of British documentary film, um, there were no strikes in the 30s, there was no unemployment. Um, the nearest you get to social discontent is in workers and jobs about the, uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the, the exchange 
um, where, where one man says with something approaching touchiness, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> right? Um, there's no sense of, uh, there's one film about the Spanish Civil War, uh, Children of the Storm, it's about, it's about uh, Spanish children, refugees coming to Britain. Um, you get the, 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 the most confused um, a picture of, of what was actually going on. So then you've got the question is, well, we would have to do without the films. I think we should. Um, and I know that's a hard thing to say, but I really think that there is a, um, a, a, a very important, uh, um, a, a very important self-deluding um, capacity going on here. And then the final point I would want to make, which perhaps we, uh, uh, Peter and I made a mistake, we, perhaps we should have shown you some of the other stuff. It was possible to make the other films. Um, uh, the fact that we don't know them, the fact that we don't know, um, uh, you know, the Jarrow March coverage and all of that, um, is, is, is not a little to do with Grierson, quite deliberately, because of his uh, exceptional qualities as a public relations person, burying uh, the left opposition, if I may put it like that. And, uh, and I think that's significant. So I think a lot of the films, uh, a lot of this stuff could have been made and would have been made better. Uh, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with events uh, and his criticism of housing problems as being, you know, um, exotic uh, poverty um, was the nearest that they came. And I think it's, it's extremely regrettable. Sorry. Yes, uh, I would second your opinion, especially the last part, that um, it seems that some of the icons of cultural and documentary films have um, blocked the view for other filmmakers that are still to be dis discovered. Um, my question is um, about the terming or, or the wording. Um, I think, to my knowledge, there existed a, a commission on educational and cultural film in Great Britain. And I wondered if this term cultural film has been borrowed by the Germans or if that was a, a genuine development of the phrase in England? No, I think the other way around, if anything, and it was later, wasn't it? It's the, it's the, the earliest commission that I can think of was surely post-war, but I might be no, wrong. No, it's 30, 32, 1932, first commission on educational and cultural film. I don't remember this at all. You've, mm. you've beaten me. Well done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was my, it um, was my attention. Um, I suspect, though, that even so, we would have probably borrowed it from Germany rather than the other way around. The British are a big Goebbels-like when the word culture is mentioned, as you know. Um, I, do, I don't know that... Uh, I don't, it, it doesn't strike me as being part of the, 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 the dominant rhetoric. And certainly the, 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 the surrounding non-film expertise around, around Grierson is, is, is sort of... Um, ignorant about general cultural forces. For instance, in the pages of Scrutiny, right, which is the intellectual literary magazine of the time, um, he's described as an English proletarian. Um, so I think that, uh, that uh, the notion that we, that we might have given you the term prima facie, I, I, I will say, from a position of uh, um, unsullied ignorance of the commission you're talking about, I feel very ashamed about not knowing it. Um, uh, it sounds unlikely to me that I would be very surprised. So, um, <laughs> I prefer to speak German because yes, okay. I think the majority um, are German, so, and my yeah. English is not so good. No, 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 no. Uh, hold on, I'll put on my... Ich okay. möchte mich zum Anwalt von Gräsen machen und äh, ähnlich wie der äh, Vorredner. Ich finde, es ist sehr interessant zu vergleichen Coalface mit Stahl von Ruttmann. Ähm, die Erzählweise von Grierson ist ruhig, objektiv, mit vielen Zahlen. Und Sie erwähnen, man hätte ja vielleicht auch nicht nur sagen können, dass uh, one of five was endured. Man hätte es zeigen können. Aber wenn eine Krone als Symbol uh, für Post Office, dann kann ich es wahrscheinlich nicht zeigen. Es gibt Beispiele im europäischen Film, etwa über den Streik in Paris, der von der kommunistischen Partei finanziert wurde. Da kann ich natürlich andere Dinge zeigen. Aber in dem Augenblick, wo die Krone auf dem Abspann ist, da ist das nicht möglich. Und ich, was ich aber sehe, zumal ich das Gefühl habe, dass 
Filme von Ruttmann sehr überschätzt werden hier, ist die demokratische Art zu erzählen. Es ist kein Heroismus oder ein sehr gepflegter Heroismus. Es hat nichts Agitatives und Überzeugendes, eine, einen hohen Grad an Information, typisch Englisch, also Population, Produktion, und bemüht sich nicht auf eine Rotmannsche oder auch Riefenstahlsche Weise äh, Emotionen ohne Informationen zu produzieren, die ein Publikum äh, zurücklassen, wo Bertolt Brecht gesagt hätte, glotzt nicht so romantisch. Okay. Well, I, I mean, obviously, I, I, I take the point. Um, um, I think that is clearly the case that uh, that they they did um, the British films do have a, a a certain style, but it's like a facsimile of uh, of reality. It's a rejection of the poetic. Yeah, that is certainly true. That that Grierson um, uh, had a had a, a real rhetoric about Flaherty. You know, this famous remark about we will film men against the coalface, not men against the sky. And he then proceeded to film men against the coalface as if they were against the sky. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question of, 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 uh, of uh, having um, that veneer yeah, of factuality, of facticity, uh, uh, which was a gesture towards the, the funders, I think, very often. Um, as regards influences, I think it is very Im interesting that they were, uh, I think, less so by the time Cavalcanti came, and certainly by the time Cavalcanti was running the unit. Um, but, but in the earliest phase, and uh, uh, um, uh, Grierson himself as a filmmaker, which of course he didn't make very many films, as you know, one, Drifters, um, they were very influenced by, um, by um, Soviet theories of montage. But specifically, they've always said specifically by Turksib, And I think that Turksib is really interesting because Turksib actually shows how to run away from social meaning in some rather interesting way. Yeah, and uh, and uh, um, Turksib, they love Turksib, and they spent a lot of time watching Turksib. They didn't like Vertov, as you know; they thought he was silly. Um, they didn't mention Rutman, um, and obviously after '33, there would have been a real problem about cross fertilization. But certainly, the general ambiance around. Um, the reception of documentary film in Britain, as I was growing up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is that um, that you know these films were absolutely great and tremendous and wonderful and our real contribution, and that the rest of Europe was very much more emotional, poetic and personal, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that the Americans really had a very attenuated um, tradition because of Perry Lorenz, who absolutely copied Grierson and never had the grace to acknowledge that he had done so. I'm not sure that I agree with much of that. <laughs> Yeah. Thomas, yeah. Um, yeah, I would uh, like to stress the point that uh, there is um, this other kind of movies which we haven't seen here, the films of the left wing uh, mm -hmm. uh, workers' reels uh, uh, societies and uh, like like uh, Hunger March or sure. Bread and um, one of my favorite is uh, Adriana Hanes and Michael Berg, uh, Berg, Berg's film uh, The Revolt of the Fisherman from, yeah. 60, from 36, yeah. which is a really very good film, yes. and uh, Ava Montague film Defense of, Sp of uh, Madrid. Uh, yeah, all Madrid. these films are very important, but we most of the time we don't know them because we are dominated by the Grierson School. Yeah. And so I would like to ask Mr. Winston if he can uh, at least describe his uh, impression of the differences of the approaching of uh, uh, okay. Real reality to the, to yeah. the um, in comparison to the Grierson group. Okay, well the first thing is that they're always on the wrong side of the police barricade. Yeah? Which is, which is a characteristic, I think, of the left archive in the 30s that, that uh, um, you know, whenever there's footage of demonstrations or anything, that the cameras are always with, with the demonstrators, not with the police, which is really different from uh, mainstream activity. Um, the second thing is that they're very much more journalistic, largely. Um, uh, and the third thing is they also use graphics, but for quite a different, uh, very much more overtly Soviet uh, agitational purpose that the that the intertitles because a lot of the films are still silent well into the 30s that the despite i don't know whether the gentleman's here who was talking about the uh, 60 millimeter sound system from 1935 which i it's the one i think it is 
didn't work and you couldn't edit it, but that's another story. Um, the fact of the matter is that there were no, that there were no that there was no not much um, uh, um, uh, comparability, I think, in terms of the style. Th these guys fetishized, um, you know, what they saw as professional norms. Um, they, they were not members of the union, that's the other thing, they were not members of my union, um, uh, which was really significant. They all got honorary memberships in the, in the 60s when they were very old. And, uh, and the communists um, like, um, like Ivor and, uh, and uh, Ralph Bond and people who had founded the union and, uh, um, and, and couldn't persuade Grierson. Grierson said to Ralph Bond one day, of course, Laddie, I'm a member of the Transport and General Workers. Get out of here. But I've actually checked, and the Transport and General Workers have no record of his membership. This is not untypical. Um, the fact of the matter is that, that both in their personal behavior, and, p personal political behavior, and in, in terms of the aesthetic they were deploying, there is that very real difference. I mean, there's a film made on a building site. I don't know whether you've seen it, about, about a, a wildcat strike, which was shot by a builder with a little camera sort of tucked under his raincoat illegally. It's very difficult to understand. Um, the, the narrative is sort of extremely attenuated and uh, confused, but it has a real power and a presence, which um, the pictures of, uh, of, of uh, um, proletarian life that you get in spare time, of course, don't, you know, simply don't, don't share, uh, it seems to me. Although occasionally the woman who runs to get the child at the beginning, that's the sort of thing that Jennings came to capture rather better, I think, a bit later on. But there is a very real difference in terms of the aesthetic styles and, and, a, very, and a, very, sorry, a very consistent internationalism about the style, that, the, that all of the footage that you, know, that, that you can look at around the world, I think Bert makes this point, is, is very similar, it seems to me, even more similar than modernity. Um, now, uh, Brian, you told us that uh, these films of the Grierson factory have not been shown usually in commercial theatres. So can you tell us uh, something about the program in commercial theatres? There were, of course, the newsreels, but apart from the newsreels, have there been any non-fiction films regularly shown? Yes. And uh, what, what kind of films? Yes. Maybe, uh, maybe not good films like uh, the films of the Film and Photo League, but maybe bad films, I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, first of all, to, to say that there were some films that, that were shown in theatres, yeah. So we must never, you, you can't dismiss the whole oeuvre as never being seen in theatres. Nightmare was, was screened in, in theatres, etc. Second um, thing to say is that the structure of the industry uh, at the time was a total vertical integration and that the travelogues were used. So there was always a cartoon, a travelogue, and a feature film, and a newsreel, yeah? <clears throat> and, um, and that Grierson's idea was to insert himself um, in, in place of the travelogue. But the, but the travelogues were, were cost nothing, yeah? Um, they cost, I think, you know, 15 shillings, 75% of a pound um, to, hire, you know, to rent a travelogue. They were given away by the, by the theater owners so that um, Grierson was effectively, all outside filmmakers were effectively excluded from, uh, from uh, that route of exhibition. And then, <clears throat> as the 30s progressed, you got to, uh, you got to double features. Um, which put yet a further squeeze on. The government's response, of course, after the war at the <coughs> time of uh, parallel with the uh, uh, Groupe des Trente in Paris, the, the government's response was to uh, bring in a quota um, and British films, you had to show a British film as a second feature, which led to the worst of all, you know, if Truffaut is right about the British and cinema, he must be thinking about quota quickies, they were called, and they all lasted 61 minutes because in order to match the law, I think they had to last an hour, right? So they did an hour and a minute. Um, and uh, they're really terrible movies. Um, but there was never any space. So Grierson, therefore, um, in order to maintain the rhetoric with the sponsors, the, the GPO and, and other uh, industrial sponsors, um, began to develop the notion of uh, alternative venues. And by the mid-30s was already saying that um, uh, you know, church halls and, uh, and uh, 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 union meetings, et cetera, et cetera, were going to be more important. The bottom line is, by the time you get to the war, the highest number of seats claimed, which I actually think is, I think everybody feels is grossly inflated, is the highest audience they claimed, annual audience, was 18 million people in 1943. 
And you think, 18 million people, that's not bad, you know, outside of the cinemas, until you realize it represented three days of commercial theater tickets. Every man, woman, and child in Britain during the war went to the movies once a week. <laughs> so 18 million is like nothing. Um, and, and, and he was effectively excluded. And that slowly undercut um, uh, the viability of the project to the point where he was personally, I think, uh, something of a liability with the bureaucrats of the Treasury because he was constantly overstating how effective the stuff was. And, it, and there wasn't ever, a de there wasn't even a, a, a demonstrable um, a return in terms of audience figures. Yeah? I hope that answers the question a bit. Did you have. One, one, one more uh, question. Oh, sorry, Peter. Brian. I think I want to go to the, your basic and central argument. Um, as I, if I understood you right, it's, it's um, all documentaries are in a way propagandistic in different ways, but uh, not only the British, from your books I know, uh, you think uh, it's everything um, in a way you can describe it as propaganda. And um, I think you are right because um, all these documentaries are influenced by their sponsors, made be the state or made be industries or something. But um, then we have to uh, make big differences um, of the kind of propaganda uh, they are working for. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a difference if it's a propaganda, maybe for example, with nazi phrases for a special party or with um, common idealistic phrases for the common public uh, in the public service or for special products or per, uh, for, for special institutions and, th and so on. And so um, I think um, that's the point. We have to uh, make new differences and uh, to try to, um, yeah, to, be, uh, to divide uh, not only the production of several countries but of types of pro uh, documentaries. And for example, your last film, Jennings, <clears throat> okay, it, it was idealistic in approach, uh, in uh, especially the last sentence. That's the way uh, men can spend their spare time uh, in a good way. But the camera showed another thing. It okay. showed the uniformation of this uh, yeah. spare time, yes. the uniformation of these houses. Mm -hmm. the, the, the camera was, and the pictures were, much more critic than the commentary. Yes. And that's often the case. And um, so uh, I think uh, we, we have to look for the pictures and uh, separate them sometimes from the commentary or, or see the contrasts in, uh, uh, in viewing all these films. Just to, just to respond to that quickly, because we, we must stop. Um, but uh, I think we must stop, mustn't we? Oh. Okay. Um, the, yeah. the, okay, 11 o'clock will stop. The, um, the um, uh, point about propaganda, of course, is, I mean, I'm just, I'm hiding behind El Lourdes, um, and, the, and the, um, the analysis of propaganda, okay, it's very old now, but I think it's still a very valuable tool for a starting point for consideration of these issues. Um, and that the notion of social propaganda, of passive, background propaganda. Elul actually in propaganda, in the book, he quotes uh, French film, if you see French film on the grandeur of France. And, uh, and he actually uses film as a specific example. And he clearly has, you know, the sponsored film in mind. Um, it seems to me that's a very good place to start. The second point to make is the point about <coughs> the uh, 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 pr propaganda is not necessarily a negative, right? And um, um, I, I, I wrote a monograph last year about um, Fars was started, which is Jennings' um, longest film and is actually a, a very much a dramatized, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's real firemen, but they're not using their real names and, they, and they're on the set at Shepparton. And, uh, and the fire that we have about uh, the Nazis burning London in the archive was actually started by Humphrey, not by the, not by the Germans. Um, so it's a rather strange film from that point of view. But it's absolutely a brilliant piece of propaganda because it works, it seems to me, in this very subtle um, social propaganda way. And Elul also describes the mechanism of uh, not... Uh, not running against the common understanding of the audience. And Jennings, I think, eventually in the war became absolutely brilliant. So that the film is totally heroic. It's about the need for sacrifice. You know, one of the firemen dies, as many of you know. Um, uh, it's, a, it's about the, the, you know, it's about one nation. There's no social conflict there. Are, you know, these upper class volunteer firemen, they're working for a, 
a cockney, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, the women are all um, uh, amazingly subservient. There were women involved in firefighting. Of course, you wouldn't show that because that would be bad propaganda at the time, and so on, and all of those things. Yet there are, there's in the film enough for people to understand that they're watching a picture of some sort of reality. There's a gesture, yeah. Um, and maybe this is a point about a liberal state, um, that, there's a, that there's a gesture um, so that, for instance, one of the firemen, they're polishing the fire engine, right? And one of the firemen, um, the, the guy who's, uh, who's selling uh, black market uh, braces, suspenders for the trousers at one another point in the film, he suddenly says, he goes, come on, friends, don't work so fast. We've got to make this last till lunchtime. And I always feel that if Goebbels sitting in this room had seen that on the screen, he would not have passed it. Yeah, but that's really brilliant. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I always quote Shakespeare, right? Um, because it comes back, I think, to a moment in Henry V, which is the great, I think that's the other poor thing there, Goebbels' poor thing, he never had Henry V. He had to make do with Friedrich Le Grosser. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> um, but in Henry V, there's this wonderful scene when Henry walks through the camp, the prose scene, just before Agincourt. You know, I shall bring a little touch of Harry in the night. The, in, in theatrical terms in Britain, it's always called Harry in the night. And, uh, and he, he talks to the common soldiers, to Cockneys, and he says, well, I think the king's, a, you know, maybe the king's a bit scared, right? And, and the Cockney soldier, Bates, looks at him and says, uh, I would he were in Thames, up to his neck, and I'd buy him, for many a poor man will die today, and so on in the middle of the great patriotic poem. So there's a sense in which um, this point about um, coming up with more sophisticated, I'm sorry, I've been very anecdotal, but coming up with more sophisticated understandings, I think on the back of works like El Lul's or J.A.C. Brown's or whatever, um, and some more recent um, uh, theorizing of propaganda effect uh, is actually important. And I, I, I think it's a sort of neutral term in many ways for me now. Yeah. Wenn wir halbwegs in dem Zeitplan bleiben, würde ich sagen, wir machen Sorry. jetzt noch die beiden letzten Fragen von Herrn Tode und Herrn Brandt und dann äh, gibt es die Pause. Okay. Because you were talking about the notions that Grierson School uh, developed later on in the 30s, I was reminded that uh, even the word documentary uh, was not only an aesthetic notion, but uh, a strategic uh, option. Absolutely. And uh, as uh, uh, Rosa, uh, no, not Rosa, um, Cavalcanti always stresses, I, I quote from my souvenirs, he said, uh, the suggestion of a document was an important argument to, for a, a, a um, conservative government. Absolutely. So, uh, do you have a comment on this? Yes, I mean, I think it's right. I mean, they knew that that's how they, that's how they did it. They pretended they were a lot more respectable than they were. That's my point. <laughs> they just, and they spoke different languages to different people. Um, my first impression is about the different using of the music in Christians, uh films and in the so-called German culture film. Um, in, in, in the contrast of the slow talking uh, style of this movie, we heard always music very fast driving. Mm. Uh, for instance, when the uh, coal workers are going along their, uh, their way or only in, in one of uh, the spare, team, uh, spare um, time uh, movie, we have a, a small part of very slow music when the singers are singing about it. But mostly, in spite of the slow walking people, we have a very fast driving music, like a contrast. Gives, uh, this gives the, uh, the movie a special drive. And my question is, is this a typical um, moment in this Grissom movies, or is that only my first impression about this uh, uh, examples here? Um, well, first of all, that there, there, there is the there is the similarity which um, Thomas pointed out yesterday about the use of uh, significant contemporary composers in each of the countries, and that they, and that in the middle period of the 30s, of course, Britain was on the payroll, so that was a, Britain wrote a lot of stuff. But what you're, what you're referring to is a particular aspect of Jennings. Jennings was obsessed with music and made a number of films which were actually based on their soundtracks. Uh, Listen to Britain, significant uh, title. Um, uh, but, but he was always making, you know, he wanted to make 
um, um, Listen to Britain. Was it Listen to Britain or was it something else? It was called Tin Hat Symphony. Which one was Tin Hat Symphony? I forget, my mind's going. Senior citizen moment, I please apologize. <laughs> um, but anyway, he was always obsessed with the, with, with the, with the use of all sorts of music um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and used it as one of the layering effects. Um, but by the time you get to the really developed, um, by the time you get to the really developed cinema of, Gre of uh, Jennings, you're really not talking about Jennings, you're talking about a, 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 a two people at once. You're talking about Jennings and Stuart McAllister, his editor, who was the real genius of putting these various levels together, which are extremely complicated. Um, <clears throat> so that there's, um, for instance, in Diary for Timothy, which is the most extreme uh, Jennings movie from this point of view, there's, a, there's a, a moment when the reservoirs that were built in the city to put the fires out in the Blitz, um, uh, you see these reservoirs and the rain is falling on the reservoir, right? And you hear Quinton Reynolds, the Canadian war correspondent, talking about the men trapped at Arnheim, um, you know, drinking rainwater out of their helmets. And you hear Myra Hess playing Beethoven, right? Um, and then you get, um, you get um, uh, Michael Redgrave uh, talking lines written by uh, E.M. Forster. Do you like that music, Timothy? It's addressed to the baby. Do you like that music, Timothy? It's German music, Timothy. Yet some of us think it's the greatest music ever written. You'll have to think about that, Timothy. It's like amazingly complicated stuff. Um, and, and, and the most sophisticated uh, filmmaking, I think, that uh, has ever actually inserted itself anywhere near the mainstream um, in Britain, in my view. That's very specific to Jennings, that sense of the, the contrast that Kai mentioned at the beginning and that you've just mentioned, contrast between picture and words, between um, music and other parts of the soundtrack. And one last word, um, just to say that the commentary on that last film was spoken by, but not written by, um, Laurie Lee, who was one of the great, another r extremely important, um, rat not extremely important, rather minor actually in the eye of history, but a, a, a radical figure who came from um, the countryside, who came from Gloucestershire and wrote a wonderful book about, um, about Spain. Now people are saying he died, a couple, he died last year. People are saying he made it all up, but it's a wonderful book. It's called As I Walked Out One Morning. Plug for Laurie Lee, why not? I think it's time to walk out here yes. <laughs> to the break. Um, thank you very much, Brian, for Welcome. this interview to the British. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.